Hi, Veronica. Hey, Sarah. How's it going? It's good. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and welcome, everybody, to Thick as Thieves, the podcast where we talk about art heists and we delve into the investigation and the details of the artwork and who did it and why they did it, if we know why. I love that after like a stretch of not seeing you, I first see you in this pink room with headphones on. I know. Yep. Like it's like, what's up? Um, <laughs> we have to get down to business. We got to get down to business. Let's talk about Minneapolis. Okay. Because I just went there. <laughs> um, I revisited Minneapolis after being away for two years. And I should mention to the people listening that I lived there for three years. Why'd you live there? <clears throat> Fine, you don't have to enter. My graduate school addiction problem. <laughs> yeah, I did grad school and at the U of M. Every time I ask you why you live there, it's because of like any city you've ever lived, it's grad school. <laughs> it is not true. There have been some cities that were like a job, a yeah. person that I was dating. Mm-hmm. Um, that's only one person, but yeah, it's like here. I'm just going to explain to everybody why grad school appeals to me because every school thing that happened before grad school was disappointing essentially but i was raised by a dad who was a teacher so i think that's part of why the bar was high like he was kind of a natural instructor you know professor like he had a way of being and then school just sucked i hated it (laughs) and i didn't start liking it till college kind of and then it wasn't until like i went out and started working in the world that i was like hmm how do i learn more things and then also be more eligible for jobs, I guess. And grad school spoke to that. And I have a lot of criticism of grad school, but this program at the U, that's what we call the University of Minnesota, (laughs) was awesome in the sense that it like gave me complete financial support for the three years I was there, including like the best health care I've ever had. And, you know, some really cool um, faculty members like Charlie Baxter and love him. Yeah, he's so great. And um, (laughs) some other terrific ones, including my thesis advisor, Kim Todd. So anyway, the point is, I went back there. And what I love about Minneapolis and what I kind of didn't realize was normal there, but not normal in other places, is that everybody has like books in their bags. And everyone's going to talk about them. And not only that, they're going to like, start reading out loud from them while we're talking (laughs) about the books. And they're going to give you books and say you must read this or if they don't give them to you they're going to order them for you and send them to your address like today I already received a book I was just in Minneapolis yesterday (laughs) and I received the book called The Bear from Matt and Jenna lovely couple in Minneapolis yes it's a book about bears (laughs) we have a bear story (laughs) so Veronica and I went camping in the Smokies last weekend and there was a bear (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so maybe like, two bears there was two bears yeah but there was one memorable bear <laughs> just say why it was memorable real quick it was memorable because well it was my first time legitimate camping and it snuck up behind me while we were eating food i didn't know that bears just like wander up to whatever <laughs> whatever food source it smells i thought it was wanting to eat my flesh and bones <laughs> and i lost it i totally i lost it i gotta share a bear story i know this is not related to art but it, it could be um i'll make it work i'm gonna loop it into something <laughs> art related right, you're gonna but... have to tie it in somehow okay the thing is so sarah i've encountered bears but not like that actually where it just like comes up to your you cooking dinner at a campfire and it's like poke poke like yeah hi can i join you for dinner <laughs> essentially is what this bear did terrifying And Sarah was the first to see the bear. And when she jumped up and said, bear, I just thought, oh, there must be a bear in the distance. But actually, it was like four feet away or something. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So it ran away, but it was kind of hanging out. And basically... It kept coming back. It kept coming back because it wanted to eat our food. So we had to eat all the food. And and this is We had to eat all the food when my appetite was completely gone. (laughs) Yeah. Because Sarah said, how do we get rid of the bear? And I said, we get rid of the food. And then Sarah said, let's go get rid of the food then. And I'm like, we got to eat it. (laughs) Like all of the food that we just cooked real fast and then put it in a bag and then do the whole launch it into the tree line. Yeah. It was the worst. (laughs) One of the, the food was delicious, but it was one of the most anxiety riddled meals I've ever had in my life. 
Anxiety is a big part of today's episode. Oh, is it? But I'd like to say one more thing about the bear thing that I'm never <laughs> going to forget. So there's a point um, before dinner, Sarah had peeled an orange and eaten the orange. And <laughs> before we went to bed, Robin, who is with us, who's like a very experienced hiker, camper, wilderness goddess woman. Yes. Um, she, she was like, we got to get rid of the toothpaste. We got to get rid of this. We got to put it all in this bag. Sarah says, what about my hands? <laughs> My hands are covered in orange juice from peeling an orange. And we're like, eh, you'll be fine. And And, mm. she's like, but what about if the bear wants to eat my hands because they have orange on them? I was thinking it through. Look, I was being extra cautious because I didn't know. uh, uh, Still. Are you at the point yet where you're looking on this fondly? or Are you still like looking at it with terror? I'm caught. It's getting to that point a little bit, but it's still, it's still is terrifying to me. <laughs> uh, yeah. But. And then you thought the bear was cute. Oh, that drove her crazy. <laughs> she was so annoyed by everybody. She was so annoyed. <laughs> I really By was. me liking the bear. <laughs> like, I was just like, oh my God, it's so cute. <laughs> and I just could not get on that level with Mm-mm. you. I just wasn't no, there. No, I, I gave her a look and the look on her face was like, I want to kill you. <laughs> Like, suddenly I wasn't, like, I, I actually had never been scared of the bear. But maybe I should have been. But I, when I saw Sarah's face, I was like, I'm scared. I'm you told Sarah. me to go into my tent. <laughs> Sarah, that rhymes with Bera. Yeah. <laughs> I said, go into your tent. <laughs> oh, boy. So that was fun. So mm-hmm. that's, the, that's the bear story. That's the bear story. But here's how it's related to art. The book, The Bear, is actually about how the bear's image changed a lot when Christianity entered Western Europe. Mm -hmm. So it mostly takes place in Germany. It's a historical book about how up until like Christianity reigning Western Europe, Germany, etc., the bear had been revered as like a spiritual, powerful figure. But there was a bear genocide because bears were seen as the kind of scariest, strongest, um, and like kind of most powerful animals but also because within like pagan beliefs and so on bears were seen as almost human like the closest humans could get to an ant like an animal like in terms of resembling one mm-hmm. i mean and like okay humans are animals what you know but what i'm saying is the human world and the animal world are different and humans loved bears in a way until christianity came and like stomped them all out so there's all this artwork bringing it back to the art (laughs) of bears being like caged tortured and humiliated oh wow in this book including like do you recall any references to bears being like brought into the royal court and having to dance around and do tricks for the royalty it's kind of shown in maybe even disney movies and yeah yeah that's the advent of christianity in western europe and is it like a humiliation thing yeah there's like a whole chapter on shame and humiliation with bears and then it also talks about the rise of the lion over the bear even though lions were not in europe or definitely not Western Europe. So mm-hmm. it's fascinating. And it made me only love bears more. <laughs> and feel <laughs> Well, maybe I'll read it and then I'll... I mean, I'm trying to develop my love for the bears. That's the, that's my goal. We might even get bear tattoos. So we... I know. You know. You know. Anyway, this story speaks to today's heist because anxiety is a big part of the artwork and the double heist. Double heist. So what are we talking about? This week, we're going to talk about The Scream. Classic. We have been focusing within this um, podcast on art heists that were done with works that are lesser known, I think. Mm -hmm. Like, maybe well-known, sort of, but not like the Mona Lisa. We haven't talked about that. We haven't talked about the Gardner heist. Why? Because there's an entire podcast about that. And it's great. It feels, it's so good. And it feels sort of silly to like, well, let's talk about that one. Yeah. And The Scream is another famous one. But... It's interesting because it's not one. It's two. It's two heists. And The Scream Mm. is not one painting, but arguably, well, not arguably. It's definitely two paintings and maybe more. Oh. So it's like... So we got a double heist. We got a double heist in Norway. Same artist. Like, connected to the same series, but different, two different museums. One being the National Gallery in Norway. The other being the Munk Museum. Mm -hmm. And different time frames, but kind of relatively close. And so I guess in a way, I'm interested in 
talking about this one because it is often seen as one heist of one painting. Mm-hmm. People have talked to me about it like, are you going to talk about the scream getting stolen? And I'm like, which time? Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, there's been more than one time that it's been right. stolen. It's it's the way information just kind of gets like shoved together and turned into a nugget, into one sentence. And, and then people forget that. Right. Yeah. But this is kind of a complicated one. So well, let's go dig it back up. Yeah. And figure out what really happened. So the scream, which in Norwegian is called skrik. Skrik? <laughs> Maybe pronounced skrik, <laughs> but it's spelled S-K-R-I-K. That's way cuter than scream. Skrik. I know. I know. Skrik. I, <laughs> I like it with like skrik. Yeah. It's got a little sh- like shriek. Uh-huh. Rhyme. I like it. The first heist that I want to talk about is in 1994. Also, can I say one thing? Yeah. Listeners, if you don't immediately recognize what we're talking about when we say the scream, Google it because you know this painting. It, it's, it's a very well-known painting, so if you just... Look it up on the interweb. Actually, this is really good that you're pausing to talk about this. And even if you don't have Google, <laughs> what? There are parts of the world that don't have Google. And someone's I don't think our podcast this. is getting there then. <laughs> really far away on a tiny island. Let's lay it out a bit. Okay, the scream was ruined for me by college posters. Mm hmm. Sucks. It's one of those. It's actually yeah. like a really cool artwork that was mass produced into like shitty posters that and everyone who thought they had something, some like minor interest in art had a poster of the scream. Thankfully, I'm not included in that. Um, Neither am I. But I, you know, I had equivalents. I, did, I had Kandinsky posters. Boom. Done. I think it's even worse that you had a Kandinsky poster on what? Your college no way. Room. Wall. <laughs> no, Kinesis cool, too. The thing is, artwork kind of changes when it becomes this mass-produced image that people can just slap up on a wall, and they don't look at it the same way. But, I mean, mm-hmm. I guess how are we supposed to look at it? We can talk about that more. But the scream is known as this. It, it drew so many people in. We have Monk, Edvard Monk, Norwegian artist, who was an excellent painter and did drawings and beyond that but the scream is maybe his most famous painting besides the fact that it's been stolen twice because it is this just sort of mesmerizing piece where there's a person maybe a figure on a bridge yeah might even not be it, wow can't talk might not even be a person who knows? might not even be a little dude <laughs> here's where you go real southern now <laughs> <laughs> yes, we don't know. Is it a man or a woman? We don't know. It doesn't matter because it's really just a figure that is gaunt, that is known, and it, mm-hmm. on a bridge holding their face. I'm choosing there as like a gender neutral pronoun. In, and screaming. How do we know this figure screaming? The mouth is open, but it's like the whole vibe of the painting seems to show that this figure is in some sort of agony. Yeah, um, I mean, everything around it is... Beautiful. dissolve and kind of like i mean it's it's dissolving in some way that like i don't know to me it just is very panic panicky yeah very expressive open eyes the part i think that's the most haunting is this figure is covering their ears mm-hmm. um behind it is a sky that is actually based on a sunset but does not really give off a sunset vibe here but it is based on a bridge in oslo which during Monk's time, he's a 19th century artist, and the screen was done in 1893, or at least premiered in 1893. It was done in Oslo when Oslo was known as Christiana. Mm -hmm. It had another name. Mm -hmm. And then it went back to Oslo, essentially, pulling Oslo back from medieval times. So the story is that Monk was walking across this bridge at sunset in 1892 in the winter, And pulling from his journals, he said that he was walking with some friends. The sun is setting. He thought the sunset looked like blood. And he paused. They continued walking. And what he saw in the sky was like blood and guts and tongues. And he felt extreme anxiety. And what he said, the quote is that he sensed an infinite scream passing through nature. Oh, so that's where it comes from. Essentially. But then... A few years later, he described it differently, a little differently. He says that he was feeling extremely ill. So in a way, it's almost a self-portrait that he had to stop for a moment. And in this moment of beauty, which I think a lot of people would agree, the sunset is typically beautiful. Mm -hmm. But in this moment of beauty, he's feeling terrible inside. So it was a way of showing his inside world against the outside world. 
one that feels very ugly, the external one feeling very beautiful, but somehow the beautiful one becomes ugly as an extension or... Right. And then you've got these two people who are walking on the bridge behind him Mm -hmm. and they seem to be just having a grand old time. I mean, there's no reason to think that they aren't. They're just kind of casually walking, seemingly like enjoying the sunset. Which could be the representation of his two friends. Right. Yeah. And sometimes when I think of it in terms of what if this happened today, you know, what if it was a thing where he's feeling, you know, sometimes I minimize these stories and it's not this person who's tapping into some grand spiritual existential self, but rather he's hanging out with his friends and they're in great moods and they've been drinking and they're fine, but he's feeling really horrible Mm -hmm. and says like, can we take a break or can we do this thing instead? And they're like, oh, you're such a wet blanket why don't you just take a breather and they keep walking and chatting about whatever they're talking about. And maybe it was a moment of more social anxiety than anything, but whatever it is, this picture, I think definitely depicts anxiety. Yes. This is, this is my feeling when the bear walked. Yeah. That was your face. (laughs) That was my face. It was. So apparently there were four versions of this and two are painted and two are in pastels, but it was debuted in 1893, and and it's collected in two locations within Norway. Okay, so do they look identical, or do they are they different? Are there mm. different things about them? Like, I'm wondering if the two paintings, like, if they are pretty similar, or if there's one that, like, takes the cake very, that we all know. Very similar. I don't want to say they're, like, clones or copies of each other, essentially. I feel like there's variations, and maybe I should know more, but, well, I should, but... Hmm. But I think they're very similar. Okay. But what happened was that, I mean, this painting became worth an incredible amount of money. Yeah. Like, so, so expensive. It made it big. Made it really big. It's weird when artworks that come from artists go from being this sort of expression of whoever they are. And and I use the word expression. Actually, Monk is considered kind of a one who played a big part in how expressionism was perceived and looked later on in life and arguably kind of kicked it off, but not really. I mean, it depends on who you're talking to, right? Because So this painting, which is just like an expression of whoever he is and what he's feeling at this time or what he feels about the world and maybe nature screaming, whatever it is, then paintings kind of enter into a realm that looks like a stock market, you know, and then it's all about their prices just jumping, Mm -hmm. jumping up. And the scream went into that realm and was one of those like... If you're investing in stock, in a way, but investing in art, and I kind of speak like this because I worked in an art advisory firm and saw people do this, that's a stock that was like always on the rise. It's Um, surprising to me that that one did so well, considering that it is so, I'm going to say like negative, that's not the right word, but I mean, it seems like beautiful paint, you know, paintings of something serene and beautiful, you can see why that would just tick everyone's boxes and it it becomes expensive like this Mm. one is very unsettling and sort of bizarre and it's just kind of shocking to me that it gained the popularity and the price point that it did based on the fact that it is just like a very anxious painting so that's so interesting that you say that because to me it makes complete sense Hmm. that it would skyrocket because there's that shift in in his period he's at the end of the 19th century and there's that shift in the artists no longer making art to please people but making art that represents how they're feeling and it's also Mm -hmm. going hand in hand with literature that is become like modernist literature is becoming more centered on the self and the anxieties like right. even i mean we got conrad doing that we have uh, t.s Eliot and so on and then we have the visual artist doing a similar version of it showing like the inner world mm-hmm. and focusing on that instead and doing it for themselves so then later in like after they die this work becomes even more popular because it's a historical depiction of how humans are representing themselves in the world. And Mm -hmm. in a way, it was a great liberation for people to start being able to talk about themselves and their issues. I mean, now look how amazing therapy is. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think we'd be where we are with therapy if it wasn't for, obviously, Freud. I know there are people out there who hate Freud. I don't. I know he's a dick in a way, but whatever. And then, you know, I get it. Like... They're not here to argue with me. I would love to argue with all of you about it. I, I don't lionize Freud. I don't baronize <laughs> Freud. But um, I went to his, there's the Sigmund Freud Museum in Vienna, Austria. Yeah. I went there and it was 
amazing. You know, they have his couch, like the very first like sort of couch that he used in his practice <laughs> on there. I don't know. It's nice. Yeah. It's fun. I'm fascinated with Freud. I actually think his writing is so interesting. But mm-hmm. um, but here we have an example of an artist who's also expressing this inner world. And I think right. if there's one if there's one thing I've noticed about human civilization. Um, what have you noticed about human civilization, I've Veronica? That there's a relief in the expression of self that yes. um, especially the the darker, tumultuous world, in, because we all carry it with us. And it's a permission to feel that way. It, it's a yeah. per, it's permission to admit that you have these feelings inside of you, and that's okay. Right. So The Scream does an excellent job of that, mm-hmm. and, in a way. and um, Or not even in a way. But let's go to the theft. So in 1994, and it's kind of interesting, we're going to see this, it means nothing, but or maybe it means something, but Monk died in 1944, and the first this first theft of the scream is in 1994, and the following one is in 2004. Huh, interesting. Okay. Consider it nothing or consider it something based on how you feel about these sort of numbers, patterns, and such. Mm-hmm. But what happened was that it happened in May. So it, not around a holiday, which mm, is kind of different for us. It is Mother's Day? <laughs> oh, yeah, Mother's Day. But I don't know if they really no. celebrate that in Norway. <laughs> Do you guys celebrate that there? Let us know. So this piece was stolen from there very quickly. Back then they did have, you know, video surveillance, but really mm-hmm. just of the outside of the museum. What museum was it again? So it was the National Gallery. Okay. And in Norway. And basically, let's let's talk about how it was discovered that a theft happened. The thieves left a ladder propped up against the window of the second floor of the museum. And I have an image I can show you. They just left the ladder propped up there. So a smoking Sl- gun for sloppy. in the art heist world. Right. <laughs> and not only that, descriptions of this finding is that the guards and whoever went into the museum and the curtains, because this museum has curtains or did in <laughs> 1994, were just billowing in the wind. Oh, that sounds cinematic. I know. <laughs> so the story is that in um, between 50 and 90 seconds, this was stolen. It's amazing how fast this stuff happens it happens very quickly but they obviously didn't have enough time to take their ladder with them no they just left it there they go there and they they basically cut the painting off the wall with wire cutters you know based on it hanging on wire Mm -hmm. and took it out the window so they took the frame and all Mm, they took the frame they took this heavy you know a lot of them just cut it right out you know they cut out the painting and leave the frame and just take the thing which is just terrible i mean they did it overnight and they did it i guess there was a thought that people wouldn't really be concerned about this potentially happening which is also a theme Mm -hmm. like a lot of thieves are like they're not gonna really notice it happening at this moment so they went there and they broke the glass and they took the painting and they dropped it (laughs) They dropped it. This is later learned that they dropped the painting while they were going down the ladder. <laughs> yeah. They just dropped it. <laughs> what a rookie move. There's all sorts of... Did of, it get damaged in any way? Yeah. Oh, my God. Recoverable damage <laughs> in this I'm imagining one this heist. scene. <laughs> yeah. I'm, like, going down the ladder, dropping the painting. I feel like, like they what was that? drunk That's or something so before they did it. They're like, we're going to go steal this famous work <laughs> and let's get wasted and then be really sloppy about it. But what they also did is they left a very snarky note behind. Oh, please tell me that we know what it says. There are two versions of this note. I mean, as in d- translations of it. Oh, right. Okay. The basic one is, thank you for your poor security. <laughs> Another one is, one million thanks for your poor security. Another one is, 1,000 thanks for the poor security. Basically, it. it's just like, love it. Way to go. That um, is national such an gallery. asshole <laughs> remark. And then they drop it. <laughs> and then they take off. So I'm going to go into a little bit of like what happens after Can we stolen. call this episode, 1,000 thanks for the poor security? Yes. <laughs> A few days after the theft occurred, all right, so this speaks to something that's pretty popular in our, in present day international politics, which is like someone does something and then a certain group wants to take responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. In this case, when the theft happened, a Norwegian anti-abortion group said they would return the painting if Norwegian television showed an anti-abortion film Wow. That they had ready to go. And the thing is, this was dismissed fairly quickly because the government, well, they had nothing. They were just trying to bank on this. They're trying Mm -hmm. to ride this event to promote their view. That's a really interesting 
promo tactic. <laughs> yeah. Very, very intriguing. Right. There was also a million dollar ransom demand made, but none of that really panned out. I'm, I kind of want to try that. Like the next time some something gets stolen, just be like, um, I got it. And if you give me a million dollars, I'll give it back to you. And then just. But you very well know that wouldn't work out very well. <laughs> no, but. Although you are well suited to cover your tracks because you know how it works. Yeah, I think I could do it. I think Not I art could. heist, but criminal process. <laughs> Maybe. Which, by the way, <laughs> we've gotten to the point where we think like our listeners are just like our steady listeners. If you're, is this, if this is your first time here Hi. listening to us, hello, we are, I'm Veronica. <laughs> and I'm Sarah. And we're PIs in Nashville. We only do criminal defense investigation work. But mm-hmm. we also have art backgrounds, hence why we have an art heist podcast. This is a yes. fusion of both those worlds. So, hi, everybody. Hey, <laughs> back up to who we are. Yeah. Okay, cool. So now that we've covered that ground, we can get back to it. Yeah. There was another moment where the police, you know, shortly after this heist, they found four pieces of the painting's frame in a suburb north of Oslo and wondered if it was a cryptic message that the thieves were giving them in a way mm-hmm. that said, like, gives the ransom money yeah this is being considered so the norwegian government is in this situation really not falling for any of these things as far as i understand based on my research they're just kind of like that's not real that's not real that's not real that's impressive yeah i like that but the part that if nationalism is going to come into play here that (laughs) might upset them is that um this crime did get solved by an Englishman. Oh, burn. I know. Burn. A famous art detective from the Scotland Yard. Oh, boy. Charles Hill. Mm. He's the one who knew how to play the game to get to the painting. And basically, he took on a um, an identity of being an American um, man, art dealer, who had connections to the Getty. And somehow, by meeting with people who knew people who knew people, managed to get to the thieves themselves um, under this notion wow. that the Getty was interested in buying the scream off of them and oh, brilliant. W- would do it like, you know, with no prosecution. The or thieves anything. fell for that? That's amazing. They fell for it. I mean, he was very persuasive. Um, he had to work at it for a long time. Sure, yeah. But he worked on it and wow. it led him to a summer house in Nor- a Norwegian summer house where um, one night he gets a phone call. I mean, all right, he's not in the summer house yet, but he's near it. He gets a phone call at like midnight and they're like, okay, we want to do this. So come out to the summer house right now. And he's like, I'm going to bed, <laughs> which I think is very smart. Yeah. If he had been eager. And because been like, it shows that he wasn't desperate or, you know, he wasn't desperate or whatever. Yeah. I think that's very smart on his part because if he had been so eager. Yeah. What a mess. Mm-hmm. They would have been like, nope, this guy is not legit. But because he was wow. like, I'm going to bed and we can do this in the morning. They were like, OK. <laughs> so he shows up at the summer house and they take him to a kitchen. And underneath this carpet, there's a trap door. And through the trap door, the painting awaits. Wow. Slightly damaged. Was not- it missing? Was it missing four pieces from the frame? Um, I believe they figured that out later. Mm-hmm. But okay. that wasn't. The trap door. Yeah. So in 1996, two years I'm later. there aren't more trap doors featured in these art high stories. <laughs> well, it would I only like a make good them old, more fun. I know. I like a good old trap door. Okay. I, I want a trap door in whatever house I build yes. for no other reason except to have a trap door. I want two. I want one to be the trap door that people know about that I show off at parties. And then there's the real trap door that nobody knows about. Only me. Oh, my God. I want 10 <laughs> trap doors. Okay. <laughs> one for my friends. You have like A-list trapdoor, B-list trapdoor, C-list trapdoor. Right. Tons of trapdoors. So <laughs> do I get to know about all the trapdoors? Yeah. You uh, get okay. inside to all of them except one. What? I need to keep one to myself. Fine. It's okay. just healthy. <laughs> it's healthy to keep one trapdoor to yourself. It's, ba- um, it's called boundaries, people. Yes. <laughs> and I think Monk Fine. would totally tip his hat at that. <laughs> Um, here's a funny thing when he found the artwork and they were like how do you know it's the real deal I'm a little suspicious of his explanation I think there's more to it but this is the one that media globbed onto he knew it was genuine because there were wax marks left on the painting from when the artist had blown out a candle next to the artwork because he had painted it by candlelight 
Hmm. And I'm kind of okay. like, that's a furious <laughs> blowing out of a candle. Yeah, I've never blown done. a candle out and wax went everywhere. Well, I guess if you're, but I guess if it's like an old turning candle. an anxiety attack into a painting, <laughs> you're gonna blow that candle out with gusto when you're done. Yeah, <laughs> true. All right. In 1996, four men were convicted of this and sentenced. One guy who's kind of the most well known of the four. His name is Pal. P double A L anger, anger like E N G E R. Okay, he was known for stealing a monk painting in 1988 called the Vampire, and um, yeah. So, Hmm. so this was his second. This was his second stealing that he had been caught for. Right. So for this heist, he was sentenced to six and a half years in prison, Mm -hmm. but he escaped on a prison field trip. (laughs) Nice. In 1999. Captured 12 days later, wearing a blonde wig and sunglasses, <laughs> trying to buy a plane ticket. No, a train ticket, not a plane ticket, to Copenhagen. Wow. Yeah. I want this to be a movie. I want all these to be movies. I know. And yeah. so far, the only one that we've talked about that is one is was that Museo. Museo, which I thought was great. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think we'll have to come back to this. I don't think any of the other ones have been movies. Know. So much rich material here. Yeah. One thing that um, Anger's lawyer argued was that that he didn't do it for the money. Mm. But I don't know. I feel like if you really love the artwork, you wouldn't have dropped it down a ladder. (laughs) You would have planned a little better. Right. Exactly. Mm. So that's that story. And now that piece is back in the museum. And they made a very important decision to keep it on the first floor Ah. of the museum. So they can keep an eye on it. So if it gets stolen again, it won't be dropped like... (laughs) <laughs> 35 40 whatever feet there's a pointer for museums out there keep your really important artwork on the first floor so that way if thieves come they won't drop it down a ladder yes Little please note. take that pointer <laughs> we're trying to help you we're trying to give you good advice here we're okay. trying to help you while we also at the same time fantasize about doing an art heist right yes but you know <laughs> that's how it works so then 10 years later another version of the scream is stolen so this is two th- what was it two thousand four? So two thousand four okay. in August, mm-hmm. which we have we both know that's not a great time to steal artwork. No, um, not the, not the summer because you can't hide it mm-hmm. in your giant jacket. Yeah, but it didn't even matter because the people who stole it, these three men, went into the museum holding guns. Pointing Whoa. them around at guards and visitors. And they were like, this is an art heist. Like the way someone <laughs> says, like, this is a bank robbery. Yeah. Which, again, a lot of the art thieves that we respect would have been disgusted by this. Right. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing. A lot of the best art thieves have ethics and they don't hurt people. They don't threaten people. They just go in, they do their thing, they get out. Yeah. That's part of their whole thing. Yeah. So the guns blazing thing is not, it's not typical to. Some of the art heists we've been talking about. I know. And here's another shameful aspect of this heist. They went in there pointing guns, threatening people, threatening to kill them. And then they didn't even know where the two paintings they wanted to steal were. What? They were like, like, oh, roaming around. They were like, where are they again? Oh, my God. So a guard took them and said, here it is. Here's this one. Don't hurt anybody. So they stole the scream and they stole um, the Madonna. Another monk painting. Oh. Yeah. That happens not long after, decade later. So this is the second scream theft, but it's a different scream painting. Yeah, but it's it's a part of the same series, which is Mm -hmm. connected to monks. Kind of like he puts all these paintings into something called the Freeze of Life. as That's kind of like the title that contains all of them. And they're all Mm -hmm. broken down into different chapters, essentially. And the scream fits into one that, if I'm not mistaken, is called anxiety. Okay. So there are a few of them. Another thing, we could go into like what the scream means, but another, he was he was obsessed with death and dying and illness. And another... Sounds like a fun guy. He, yeah. <laughs> another aspect of the scream is that his sister had died when he was 13 years old of tuberculosis. And mm. the scream is inspired by that horrific event. Wow. You know, seeing his... Yeah sister dying at such a young age um, i didn't mean to make fun of him <laughs> right before you said that <laughs> i just i sounded like a real jerk you made me feel real bad about it 
so this happens just on a mellow day. It's a Sunday in August. It's an Audi. It's guys with guns. <laughs> it's Oslo. They <laughs> don't even know what they're, where the paintings are. It was ridiculous. And here's the my favorite part of this heist is that their getaway car was a legit Batmobile. What? Yeah. They, into their group, uh, like, so the fourth person was a Norwegian drag racer. He was, like, one of the best, like, sports car driving drag racers in Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, his name is Thomas Natas, N-A-T-A-A-S. And his car looked like the Batmobile, like, shaped like the Batmobile and had a Bat logo <laughs> on it. Um and he was wow. known for this car. Oh my That's, God. He didn't like have this car made for this heist. It was like a car he was known for driving. So they were just kind of dumb. So like asses. the only car like this in town, I'm sure, or like in in maybe in the, Europe or right. in the world. Yeah, and you take that Hollywood. to do your crime. Yeah, That's ridiculous. Also, can I just say this? I'm imagining. So I've got these. I've got these like mental images of these two heists. One of them. So the first one is like. I'm imagining a like Mr. Bean movie. Where they're yeah. Like, um, and then the second one is like a Harmony Corinne movie, mm. like Spring Breakers style, like guns and like weird cars. That's that's the image that's in my head right now. Harmony Corinne, a Nashville-ish director. Yes. If you do this, we must be head consultants on your screenplay. <laughs> I doubt I'll honor this, but yeah, we well. think about it. We'll send him this episode. Yeah, we'll send him a cease and desist if we hear about it. We sure will. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> Harmony. <laughs> so they also take the paintings in their frames nice. into the Batmobile. That's so funny. And right off. Here's the thing that ends up becoming kind of the most noticeable aspect of this crime when it's being investigated is the timing of it. Um, in the past, we've talked about art heists that were done to distract people from other crimes mm -hmm. that is certainly the case with this one so there was a whole like horrific story being investigated event you know being investigated in norway over a robbery in which a um, police officer was killed with machine gun wow the story of this heist is that while they were while that case was being investigated and they were getting closer and closer to kind of piecing it together, this heist was done to distract. The purpose of this heist was done to distract from that oh. investigation. So to get so cops have to focus on that too, and then attention gets it's split. like a, it's a high profile case. So mm -hmm. this is the leading theory of this heist. Money was of interest, but you know not. I wonder if they were hired by the people who did the robbery where the officer got shot. Yeah, it's called the Stavanger robbery. Stavanger robbery. So what happened was that in 2005, a year after this heist, when a man named David Tosca was arrested in connection with the robbery. Here's another aspect of this. Snitches galore. <laughs> Apparently he like said, okay, well, guess what? Not only are you, you know, by arresting me, not only are you getting insight into what happened with this robbery that led to some, like a man getting killed, it's also leading you to the monk painting. So he just like laid it all out. That's, he said, I am the a lot link. of juicy information. I am the human link between the two. Wow. Mm. Is he still alive? I would be surprised if he's still alive after that level of snitching. I know that the thieves, like once he's brought into the mix, the thieves are arrested, including the race car driver who was acquitted. So let's just jump into like trial, oh. which is still, huh. there's still courtroom proceedings. So he was just the getaway occurring. driver? But yeah, so he was acquitted. So were some other people involved. But That's the surprising. But the paintings had not been recovered yet when they were caught. When they were arrested, they still didn't have the two paintings. So that was kind of wow. this so mess. Maybe maybe they destroyed the paintings or they just didn't care about them because it was all a diversion anyways. And So the paintings did eventually <gasps> get recovered. Yay! Just they hadn't been yet when the humans who took mm -hmm. them were. Like what is understood that at the time the scream was worth, and I'm basing this on an English newspaper article, 62.5 million pounds mm -hmm. don't even ask me what that is in dollars <laughs> like a hun hundred know? million dollars something like that if you know call in and let us know yeah call us <laughs> um so the this tosca character who snitched and all that jazz he gets 19 years for leading the, the robbery but his lawyer does manage to negotiate something that kind of gets him a, like 
you know, a lesser sentence because he helped with the scream and the Madonna and getting mm-hmm. those people caught. So that's how that worked. Hmm. Maybe he only had to serve like a percentage or something. Exactly. Of the 19 years. Yeah. So who knows where he is now? Maybe he's out. Hmm. All right. So then there is the recovery of the scream of the Madonna. They finally got them back. It's based on, it's kind of floaty information. Like a a curator at the Munch Museum got a phone call in August of 2006, which is two, two years. years later. And apparently she's told in this phone call that the paintings are still in existence and they are in a van <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Not a Batmobile. Right. So this leads to her getting in touch with the police, going to the van. There are like 30 police with her. They open this van. She's there. Mm -hmm. And and in her account of this, she just starts bawling. Right. I would love to do that. I would love to be in her shoes. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Like roll up to this van with an entourage, anticipating finding these paintings. And I don't know. That sounds like a Do you cool wanna, moment. Uh, yeah, in case you guys want to know her name, I'm just going to really mess this up. It's um, <laughs> Give in- it a shot. Ingeborg <laughs> Insti. <laughs> I was not expecting that. <laughs> I was really hoping I just couldn't. I didn't have to say it, but there it is. Okay. We tried. <laughs> yeah. I tried my best. Maybe I said it right. I do have a friend hey. in Norway. Oh. If you're listening, Marta Fischelstad, <laughs> um, please let me know how I say that the right way. So the recovery happens on August 31st. It's this exciting moment. Headlines around the world. But it's not that exciting of a moment because while the Madonna is in like okay-ish shape, the scream is in horrible shape. What did they do? Well, I don't know what they did. But the scream, this one, was painted on cardboard. Oh. And it got very Why? wet. I don't know. How the hell are you going to paint something on cardboard? The artist painted it on cardboard. That's so dumb. Well, he was maybe not very, I don't know. She, she was trying to have save the money. Yeah. Sorry. It's hilarious. I keep making fun <laughs> of him. And then, and then I keep making you feel very bad. <laughs> Why would he paint on cardboard? Yeah, like, what the hell? Does he not have like a bunch of money? <laughs> Um, <laughs> so it was really wet. It was like incredible water damage. In fact, it was it was almost irreparable. I think it's still being repaired or now it's being showcased with like the best they could do with <laughs> repairing it. Aww. But it was it was like in in horrible shape. Yeah. That's the story of. Wow. The double. I'm so glad the they triple, got them double, back. Triple, double, triple, double, <laughs> heist. <laughs> I'm glad they got it back. Even if it, even if one of them was in terrible shape, you know, it's still it's like getting a human. It makes back. me so sad when the painting when the things are never recovered. I that know. is just like even if they get it back and it's in bad shape or it's you know there's something wrong with it, it's still there for human history. You know, I mean, it's we need it so bad. So I know. I think that's our as season one comes to a wrap. One of our I maybe speak on behalf of both of us. I am doing that right now. Let me know if I'm Go wrong. For it. <laughs> We are very excited about the moments when art, the artworks are recovered. I feel like our mm-hmm. heart goes out to the art. Our heart yeah. goes out to the art. <laughs> <laughs> like it's exciting. Because well, it went through so much. And then the fact that it gets home again is. I know. It's very nice. Yeah. So happy story-ish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'd say, I'd say that's a happy-ish ending. If this was a movie, it was like The Scream 1, The Scream 2. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Veronica. My pleasure. I really like that story. It's one where I do not respect any of the art thieves, except I do like the snarky note quite a bit. I love the note. I mean, the Batmobile is just... That's really good. So obnoxious. I know. And, I mean, amazing in its obnoxiousness. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's buffoonish. It is. It's ostentatious. Mm-hmm. What other words can we add? It's <laughs> ruggish. <laughs> Rafish. <laughs> fishy (laughs) (laughs) oh my goodness okay cool before we say goodbye i want to talk about the artwork that was done for our plunder drunk episode yes by simone markentel yes amazing it was so beautiful she did so good she did a great job um she did thank you simone george patel's adam and eve sculpture into Mm -hmm. a drawing that in fact i think is better than the sculpture 
Honestly, if I had to own one, it's that's killer. the one I would want. I mean, I kind of, I don't own it, but you know, we kind of like have this connection to the image now. I'm going to shut up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to steal it. <laughs> you can see it on our Instagram page. At Thick as Thieves Forever. Thick as Thieves is brought to you by We Own This Town, a Nashville home for the coolest podcast. The best. There's so many good ones. And if you haven't listened to Nashville Demystified, My Fantasy Funeral, Hot Minute, the We Own This Fan Town. slash fiction. Fan slash fiction. All of those, they're really amazing. So go check out Liquid our Gold. sibling podcasts. Taddy. <laughs> That's not a podcast. <laughs> Our theme song is by Patrick Dampier. Our podcast artwork <laughs> is by Saskia Colgis. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Um, triple, triple check. Triple, double, double <laughs> check, check. <laughs> That's amazing. Triple check. Triple, double, triple flip. <laughs> triple flip check. <laughs>